I hate it when people do this. Oh, we got the phone. First, just okay. I like to um, have things in front of me because I'm bound to knock them over. My my mother's middle name for me was Anne, which means full of grace, and she said that she wanted to name me something. I just wanted it was going to grow up to be, and then she laughs. <laughs> okay, so I like to always start off my sets with other people's poems, um, partly because, well, mostly because I'm jealous of them, honestly, <laughs> I wish I had written this poem, so I, I steal the chance to perform it. Um, so I was, ah, I'm going to preface this a little bit. Um, so I, I, I dug up my old chat books recently. Um, because somebody else was interested at work, and I was, I read through them to make sure that they were still, I still thought they were decent, because you know how it goes, <laughs> and uh, I realized there's a very distinct progression in, like, when I hated everybody, and I was still high all the time, and, like, dreamed about gutting people, to, like, the one that just got accepted for publication that will be out whenever I get Asriel, the things he asked for two months ago. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this newest one is where these are coming from. And it's called The Audacity of Flight. And um, it's very much the spiritual journey I'm in now, which um, is largely based on the Sufi practice, which overly simplified is the mystic practice of Islam. And I was reading a lot, a lot of Suf Sufi poetry when I wrote most of these poems. And this is the most influential Sufi poem I've come across so far by Rumi, obviously. Um, and it's called A Necessary Ottoman Sage. You and I have spoken all these words, but as far as for the way we have to go, words are no preparation. There is no getting ready other than grace. My faults have stayed hidden. One might call that a preparation. I have one small drop of knowing in my soul. Let it dissolve in your ocean. There are so many threads to it. Inside each of us, there's a continual autumn. Our leaves fall and are blown out over the water. A crow sits in the blackened limbs and talks about what's gone. Then your generosity returns. Spring, moisture, intelligence, the scent of hyacinth and rose and Cyprus. Joseph is back, and if you don't feel in yourself the freshness of Joseph, be Jacob. Weep and then smile. Don't pretend to know something you haven't experienced. There's a necessary dying, and that Jesus is breathing again. Very little grows on jagged rock. Be ground, be crumbled, so wildflowers will come up where you are. You've been stoning for too many years. Try something different. Surrender. I can't really bow for that one. So, I, so, okay, so that was like, whoa. And I thought it was a great preference to these new book poems because influence and all that. So, okay, so this one is called Beloved. And um, in Sufism, like, the greatest vocal points are um, sort of drunken intoxication with your connection to the divine, it's divine and service to other. And often you will hear um, references to this divine connection as being drunk. And um, the dervishes or the Sufis are referred to as the lover and God is referred to as the beloved. And so that's some of the terminology in here. Instead of bowing, when you finish the song, you should sing. <laughs> yes. I like, I'm more of the, whoa. <laughs> I really like that. Howling dervishes. Those are fun. Very akin to the whirling dervishes. Anyhow, this is called Beloved. Rumi stands behind me, whispering, daring me to pick up my pen. Still ink like blood from your jugular, he says, for that is the nearness of the love from lover to beloved. Let it burst from your heart and let it flow, flood the empty page. Watch it run down dirty skin and cleanse the spirit. 
Such is the love from beloved to lover. First drink of love, then get drunk on love. Third, live in love. Finally, become love itself. Erase the line between, that separates the lover from the beloved. Sooner or later, we will all realize that separation is an illusion. We are all one star thinking of itself. So there's a lot of darkness in my poems. We, I mean, like, you're fabulous. I totally it was right there with you. Um, and um, I've done a lot of healing from that, but I've come to accept that there's certain, I deal with mental illness, and that's always going to be a part of who I am. And so I have not excluded it. Um, it's been a, a kind of a weird process. Anyhow, so this um, poem is called Psychosis, and it's about an episode I had while driving home from work one day. Um, has to deal with bipolar disorder. And hold on, where's the other half of that poem? Oh, I skipped a poem. Oh, well, we'll go back to that. Okay. The clouds are falling, and I hear the name calling Andy, 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 press the pedal to the floor, hear the crash of metal in your mind, bring it to life. Andy, it's just one drink. How much more beautiful would this be if you were high? You wouldn't have to chase God's voice because everything would be a sign. And the clouds are falling and I'm not who I am and none of this is happening. And the voices are calling, Andy, they're drugging you. They don't want you to know the truth. Don't go to work. Don't take your pills. Don't be a slave. Andy, you are great. A god, a messenger, a savior, a slave. And the clouds are pressing on all sides. All the world is a diorama. I am a cardboard cutout. The sky is painted on the inside of a shoebox. And my brain is moving too fast. Internal car crash. Press the pedal to the floor. Andy, you know you miss the feeling of blood dripping down your arms. Andy, scream, fight, hit, flip tables. Andy, destroy. Don't keep it inside. I can't breathe this icy vapor, clouds pressing in on all sides, my lungs crystallize, the clouds seep inside, nothing is real, breath is gone, my eyes are frozen shut. It's always like awkward when people clap, like am I supposed to look at you, am I supposed to, like what do you do? <laughs> I don't know. So, okay, so this is the one that I skipped. Um, little teeny poem, little Steve Brightman sized poem. Um, <laughs> it's called In the Deep. In the deep of the night, it calls to me. It claws its way through my bedroom window and buries itself in my sternum. My passion burns, consuming me whole. You are my rain. You are the tears of the dervish that turn fire to ash. I cover myself in your soot. I am unworthy of my beloved, and though the fire is out, I continue to smolder. Wow, I am so out of order. I don't even know what happened. <laughs> like, I had it together at one point, I promise. <laughs> it's not really a thing I do, so I no. would explain it. Okay. So this is called Through Her Eyes. After wondering and worrying and questioning, I was gently assured that I have grown more than I can see. The tree cannot see through its branches how close it is to the sky. It can only see how far it has come up from the ground, but often forgets to look down. Does a rose know it has bloomed, or does it just feel the sun? Does a river know it has flooded, or does it just feel the pool of the ocean, the growing current sweeping it toward the quencher of thirst? I feel truth closer than my skin. So close we are inside of each other, and I become him, and he becomes me. I can taste the truth of unity, but I cannot see through my branches how much longer until I touch the sky. 
She reminds me how far I have come, reaching and stretching and seeking from the ground up, and I recognize the light of God in me when I look through her eyes. This one's called Dandelion. They're my favorite book. Like, I have a dandelion tattoo. Like, those are the best. All right. Um, I got a yellow dandelion tattoo on my chest, so it would never leave me. Like the dandelions in my parents' front yard that they keep running over with the lawnmower. No amount of weed killer has been able to stop them. Like the dandelion, there were times I survived out of pure obstinance. And no obstacle has been able to stop me either. Weeds are misunderstood flowers. That's why they're my favorite. I'd rather my lover stop for goldenrod than present me with a dozen roses. Despite their publicity, I've never seen a rose grow in the middle of the sidewalk. But a dandelion <laughs> seeds ride on the wind, oblivious to boundaries, like me singing out, seeking out my limitations just to defy them pull over on the side of a back road, get out of your car, and stop to smell the wild daisies and the honeysuckle and the Queen Anne's lace. Roses are fragile and need special attention and care, but those damn dandelions will grow anywhere. <laughs> Okay, so this is my Narnia poem. Like, I love Narnia. Like, I've been reading the, the Chronicles of Narnia in story order, not written order. God, throw that out there, because, I mean, people fight about that a lot. Shut up! You probably watched Star Wars starting with the end. <laughs> That's the way it was meant to be done. Story order. Okay, so anyway. <laughs> Love it, love it. So this is my Narnia poem. Like, I, I get pissed off, man. It's like, I believe in this stuff. Like, sometimes, I'm not lying, sometimes I still check the back of my closet. <laughs> Just in case. Like, you see these movies where, like, these little kids are picked to save the world with the fairies, and I'm pissed because I believe in this stuff, and nobody has ever picked me to save the world. <laughs> so, <laughs> that sounds like a poem in itself. <laughs> See, this is kind of about like real life magic, like on this plane magic, I guess. Mm. Okay, it's called Narnia. Right here in this world, this room, the space of breath between this book and you, that will be a book eventually, mm -hmm. there is magic. Worlds are born and die and reborn within us. I do not need a course in miracles because I am a miracle. If I know myself, I know God. You are a miracle. If I love you, I love God. We are one star dreaming of itself. Inside of us is the birth of Narnia. We are the breath of Aslan. We are alive with the magic of creation that lies beyond words and dreams and the comprehension of mankind. Some things are so strong that they cannot be described. Some things are so vast that they cannot be seen. The purest of truths can only be felt, and that is the fabric of our being. Truth is the cloth that we are cut from, all of us cut from the same one. Even science becries this magic. String theory declares that all things are interconnected by invisible strings of electricity. So is there really any difference between you and me? I do not end, and you do not begin. We are different formations in the same clay. Bodies and names are as superficial as makeup when it comes to the spirit. Love is the highest power. Love is the energy that binds us together. It is birth and life and death and rebirth and light and darkness and maiden and mother and crone. Open the eyes of your heart and see the beauty and drink the wine of the magic alive in all of mankind. Wow. So buy the fucking book, man. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever I get my cover photo and my bio, and, you know, I'm sure Asriel is something about it. now, right? <laughs> yes, yeah, pre-order now, and you'll get it next year.
hope what? I knew about it. Oh, I don't know why, but that felt like really sweet to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I was like, so what I what I did because I'm always be mailing manuscripts and poems to like Skylark, and I'm like, ah, oh, read this, Asriel, read this. What do you think? What was that? So I just went into like my Google account, and, like did a search for poetry. <laughs> <laughs> So I would pull up all of those things, and I forgot about this. I wrote this during a show in your old backyard when Josh Romick's wife was performing. Oh. And um, uh, uh, I was like, oh, I like this. So I was, excuse me, I was in school at the time, and I was way too busy being a domesticated housewife, student, mother, person <laughs> to be like a crazy artist, poet, woman. And so it was like the first poetry show I'd been into in like a million years. And I was like, I gotta stop doing this to myself, which I did again. But um, <laughs> so I wrote this because I was thinking about all of those things. I don't see lightning and light bulbs or memoirs in the mirror. I don't see mitochondria or arachnids or dragon's bane. Molecules beckon. Nucleons, isotopes, the law of conservation of matter, and verb conjugations. I am an artist who was left behind in a school that should have been my sanctuary. So I went to school to be a superhero, to save the other artists from the abyss under the rug, and, the prim and primary source essays, and take-home tests, and all manner of due dates have convinced me that I just don't have time to feed my soul. An artist who is... What? <laughs> an artist who has shoves, I think that's supposed to be shove, an artist who has shoved their art into a corner, told it to stand still and don't turn around until the timer goes off, and then forget to set it free. Such a person cannot be a superhero. Trying to teach a teacher how to teach to the tune of 12,000 a semester does exactly the opposite. An A-plus is a poor substitute for love. So here's to poetry and porch swings and citronella and car crashes. Here's to you and 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 being here instead of studying for my Spanish exam. Remember that car crash? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Were you there? Oh, yes, I do. Because we went out and checked on it to make sure it was okay. We're like, I wasn't there. No, I don't think you were. No, I totally was there. You were? <laughs> yes. One of those I couldn't tell it, it was, we, uh, if you were there. The Utah House. There this was a car crash while Josh was performing. <laughs> and Andy I and I ran out to... I made it three years. Because that's what happens every day. <laughs> Not wrong. <laughs> oh, shit, what just happened? You killed it. I killed it. Because you're Andy. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Killing things is not a thing I do anymore. What uh, what sort of a time do I have left? Um, two ish minutes. Two ish minutes. I don't know what that means. Is that like two and change? Like two and your approximately time? two <laughs> minutes. If you can put two pieces in there, put two pieces in there. If you put one piece in there, put one Where piece in there. Where did I go? Oh, here. You can get the phone to work. No, I just lost that. I had it up and then I touched something and this isn't my phone because my phone is dead because that's how it goes. This is all like so fucking depressing. This is like two books ago. The last one was kind of depressing-ish with some cool stuff, and the last one was depressing, and the last one was like, I would have kill everybody, including you and me. <laughs> <laughs> it was not. It was several years before another. There's one in particular I want to find. Oh, yeah, let's do this one. This is like happy. And you're all poets, so it's relevant. Well, most of you. Maybe some of you just don't know any of That was not intended to be that. Like, huh? Okay, so this is called Dear Poets, and I wrote it when I competed at NPS a million years ago. 2011? Yes, a million years ago. <laughs> Dear Poet, I saw you looking but pretended not to. I studied you in turn when your eyes, if not your mind, were directed elsewhere. What I saw was my body, all too much curve in all the wrong places. 
I saw my mental anatomical inconsistencies compressed and etched into your skin. You found my eyes and held. I did not ball up. With no pre pretext, no subliminal intentions, no future string weaving, you asked, can I lean on you? You understood that sometimes we need poetry to be tangible. I said, of course, and meant it. Dear poet, I fight the same flashback monster in my dreams. Your bravery was the blow to my chest separating breastbone from rib cage during CPR. You made me cry again for the first time in years, brought me from life to death and back again in under three minutes. Thank you for reminding me of my humanity. Dear poets, we are all top hats, old couch made vests, and daughters named Clementine. We are all too much pot smoke, godlike needles, bruises, blood, broken scrabble pieces, and gently used hearts. We are all hypocritical choir singers, 10 year old hymens, tornado survivors, relative of wolves, and Canaan land wander wanderers. We are all crayon colors, monster warriors, wussy boys, rag dolls named whore, fiercely bald heads, and someone else's new beginning. Dear poets, singing, seeing my story made beautiful in your words makes me hopeful that I am beautiful. Simultaneously drowning and throwing articulate life preservers to exhausted swimmers is how we live. So if ever you ask yourself if it meant anything, if ever you wonder why I'm standing on this stage, where my strength comes from, just look in the mirror and recite a poem. Every single reference in there was from a person or a poem at MPSA. Can I read, read one more? Yeah. Okay, this is the one I was looking for in the first place. And then I was like, ooh, look shiny. <laughs> this one is called For Terry. It's still one of my favorites. There's like this crazy chick. They used to come to the um, Vertigo's shows when I was at the Angel something. Angel Falls. Conference. Angel Falls. She lived right behind there. I saw her exactly two times in my whole life. And I was so inspired, I wrote a poem. <laughs> she was, like, crazy. <laughs> like, she stabbed her ex-boyfriend when she found him in bed with an... Uh, anyway. Okay, so this is... Her name was Terry. This is called For Terry. In a state of mind every bit as broken as 26 years of trampled eggshells, she told me she loved me. It was only the second time I'd ever seen her, but I had no doubt that those words were the closest thing to truth that she owned. Her blood clung to the pages of the FBI report, like the last prayer gurgled from the throat of a drowning child. Her tiny body shook in my arms as if, tired of being, it wanted to tear itself apart, molecule from molecule, and disperse back into the cosmos with hopes of being reborn, innocent. My fingertips read the stories in her unwashed hair like Braille, consciously blinding myself to the lectures building behind my eyes. I figured she'd had enough judgment. So instead, I let my body heat become the drug to satiate her strung up desperation for, uh, for only a moment. She untangled her corpse from my arms and screamed the word whore over and over. It ripped itself from her throat with such ferocity. I can only assume that on its way up from her stomach, it caught a glimpse of her brain and saw something there that I couldn't or wouldn't. I tried to tell her that antisocial personality disorder doesn't necessarily make her a psychopath. Her patient smiled at my, naiv my naivety. It looks like beautiful minds in here, but I'm not that far yet, she murmured, motioning to her bedroom walls, which were graffitied with obscenities and green and purple crayons. Like the rot of a kicked puppy, she was drowned in the rain that my mother taught me were God's tears. When she looked at me, the scent of her sickness eroded holes in my subconscious, and that scarred me in a way that the high-frequency quaking of her body did not have the power to. So I held her as often as she'd let me, left her with my therapist's phone number, my email address, and a book of poetry by Sharon Olds making her swear to keep in contact. 
but as I glanced again at the scars that plated the insides of her arms, deep as the night the Messiah was born, and with his first breath forgot her name, so deep I couldn't fathom how she was standing in front of me. I knew this was the last time I'd ever see her. Hmm. And it was. I still wonder about her, though. I don't know what her last name is, so I can't find her, which is probably good, because she did stab a couple people. 